Our next speaker uh, was the Managing Director of Malaysia's Strategic Investment Fund from July 2004 and to, till 2018. And like our previous speakers, he has really fundamentally changed the way that it thinks. So 14 years as its longest serving CEO. He led that fund in the region and beyond, um, and its fort portfolio value trebled during the time that he was there. He changed the way that it thought very fundamentally, and its strategic focus then fun focused around much more what he called the paradigm of stewardship rather than a paradigm of ownership. What does he mean by that? We're about to find out. Please welcome Tanshri Azman Mokhtar. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, very good morning. Thank you Tanya, uh, very kind introduction. I must say uh, congratulations to Masik. We feel disrupted already. It's not often you speak on a round stage. <laughs> the last time I, I saw this was actually about 25 years ago. It was a Madison Square Garden, and Rod Stewart was on stage. So, <laughs> so I promise you, uh, you know, I, I won't do that. Uh, but at the same time, I thought I sh it's proper that I start um, to first of all thank Masik. Uh, finally, I'm here. Uh, you know, Shuko Alhamdulillah, the, the, I think it's a big honor to be speaking to such a distinguished gathering, to share the stage with such distinguished speakers, uh, Scott, Anthony, and of course, uh, Chairman uh, Mohammed before that, and Tanya. Uh, I've been given this great privilege, uh, and before that, I just wanted to share and honor my host, uh, Masik, I've been privileged at Kazana to be able to co-invest with them. Uh, we have uh, several ventures, if I could highlight, Shuaiba, uh, Jadwa Investments, as well as uh, Faja Capital. Uh, I think the total amounts are running into several billion US dollars. And I'm happy to say that, alhamdulillah, we've been able to both make good money uh, to make a profit. But at the same time, I continue to learn uh, from the group of how to invest with purpose. And in that regard, if I'm allowed to embarrass my host slightly, uh, Abu Majid and Abu Khalid, I'm not sure whether you remember this incident, but this was fairly early during our partnership. When one fine day I received a check in Kuala Lumpur for something I did not know where did this check come from. It was actually from Masik. And apparently one of the things that we invested in it actually was services for uh, real estate in Riyadh. Uh, there was some defect in the product and they decided to refund us the money without us asking for it, right? So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the paradigm of stewardship where one, one basic underlying fact when we learn finance and commerce and investment at school or in the university, they taught us uh, the famous Ro Roman dictum, caveat emptor, right? Buyers beware. Well, you know what? I, I do know that Masik practices the dictum of sellers declare. This is a very fundamental point. Eh? And I also wanted to honor, uh, last night over dinner, I asked Brother Nasir that uh, I had the opportunity, and I see later in the agenda, that we will be honoring uh, the founder of the Masik Group. And I had the honor of actually meeting him on a couple of occasions. And I could not but be struck by you know, the personality of the late uh, Muhammad Ibrahim al Subay, and uh, I, I believe he passed away uh, a year and a half ago at a ripe old age of 103, 104. And the, his story from the time when he was an orphan at 14 years old and the trading practices, I think this is actually the future of finance. It's a history of finance, but it's also the future of finance. And really, I wanted to frame my talk. I've been asked, I could. By the way, these are very interesting topics. And perhaps during Q&A later, if I have a chance, Tanya, I'll, I'll also dive in on, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I built during Kazana essentially a sovereign venture fund within a sovereign wealth fund, within a sovereign development fund. And we must have 
uh, you know, we made gains of several billion dollars and deployed it into about 30 companies, some of whom failed, but some of them, many of them, you know, some of them have become unicorns, actually, I'm happy to say. And uh, certainly, uh, Piyush, uh, a dear friend, I would say, he used to be the city banker in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, what he's done with DBS is incredible. We're learning from him. Uh, the bank that we built, called CIMB, is one of the largest in Southeast Asia, not as large as DBS. Uh, actually, we pinched one of the innovation people from uh, Piyush shop, I think with his permission, and uh, I think this is certainly a journey that's very exemplary. But today, really, I've been asked by the organizers to complement what's been covered by both uh, Scott on innovation and by Anthony in terms of the bank of the future into looking at finance itself. And to the extent that the topic, therefore, I've chosen and the topic we talk about disruption ahead, the future of finance, I wanted to talk about disrupting this disruption in itself to return finance to its core role, or some may say its fitrah role, fitrah being the Arabic word as I understand to, our to the natural state of actually serving the real economy and not the other way around, and perhaps serving society in itself. That is not to say I grew up in financial services, I work for investment banks and very proudly so. Uh, I'm of the view that actually for 75 years, finance has been at the forefront of delivering perhaps uh, the best period of economic and development growth the world has seen over the last 75 years in the post-war period. It's just that it's also fair to say the last perhaps 15 to 20 years, it has lost its way ahead. And that was the disruption, uh, the negative disruption that has happened to finance that we need now to go back and reclaim that. So ladies and gentlemen, let me just set the stage briefly, and I really, as a practitioner, uh, as, uh, as mentioned by Tanya, and thank you for the generous introduction, I was, I'm really a practitioner and investor at heart, uh, but we need to state the, set the stage. You know most of this, so bear with me. Just five observations about the state of finance. Number one, I would say we do live in financial times. You've heard about the post-truth world, so whatever the papers are saying, I, I'm a big subscriber of the, B, the BBC, actually. Uh, the FT is right. The FT goes out and says, we live in financial times, and it's true. Many statistics, one of my favorite is as follows. The late James Tobin, a Nobel laureate, Dr. Tobin actually highlighted, and this was 20 years ago when I was in doing my master's, uh, very interesting statistic, and I'm sure this statistic is even more. If you track from 1971, what's the significance of 1971 in the financial world? This was the year Richard Nixon unilaterally took the United States away from the gold standard, a system that had been around from Bretton Woods, eh, post-war. If you take that date, and of course there were many reasons for that, the Vietnam War, the first oil shocks, and so on and so forth, and if we were to track the real economy of the world since 71 till uh, now, the growth has been roughly about 5-6% if you, let's use uh, trade uh, flows as a proxy for real economy. I mean, there's many statistics, but let's use trade flows, right? In area global, 5-6% per annum. Fantastic, right? But if we were to look at financial flows, and what are financial flows? Whether it's lending, whether it's forex transactions, whether it's derivative transactions, equity markets, capital market you need a lot scale. I cannot remember the exact number, but there is a chart somewhere and it is a lot scale. And that divergence in many ways reflects progress, but it also reflects the departure between finance or the financial economy and the real economy. As I said, this is an approximation, but you get the picture, right? Now, the second point I want to make is that while finance has brought great prosperity, it appears that the incidence and magnitude of financial crisis has also risen. My 30 over year career, I was there quite deep during two big ones. The first one was the Asian crisis in 1998. I happened to have been the head of research, investment research at Solomon. And Solomon, uh, at that time, we were the financial advisors to the government of Malaysia. And you may recall, Malaysia actually took a rather heterodox approach of applying selective capital controls and so on and so forth, right? Well, 10 years later, I was managing director of Kazana, 
And uh, as, uh, you know, we're very proud that, alhamdulillah, we managed to treble our portfolio. But you know what? In my first four years, we actually doubled our portfolio. That's, that's a rate of return of more than 20% per annum. And then everything went away during the global crisis. Right? And we were not spared. It happens to everyone, right? Thank goodness, we, our balance sheet was strong and was able to weather that. And since then, actually, it has grown by more than three times. Uh, you know, that's a rate of uh, somewhere in the low teens per annum. So it is very painful, but that's us as investors. The problem with finance, when there are crises that happens, I think it's also fair to say that it hits society at different levels with different intensity. Uh, for example, you can take the case of rising cost of living that can come from as financial flows on speculation on take, not just energy prices. I had, uh, if I can share in this forum, I understand it's Chatham House, the opportunity to sit down somewhere in Saudi Arabia in, 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 the, in the empty quarter, sitting down with a very senior person from Aramco, and this was the year, and I asked, of course, you know, I, I don't have the details, but I said, you know, how, how is the oil prices? And, and we, we, he lamented that actually banks Global banks that year, the big investment banks, were trading, was actually making more money than Saudi Aramco that year on actually selling oil. But when that happens, actually the price goes up, and when price of commodities like wheat, for example, there was a year when, for example, the prices of tortilla in Mexico or chapati in Pakistan rose many times over, and this actually affects people uh, clearly at the bottom of the pyramid much more than those uh, who were doing the speculative activity. The third point, is a follow-up on the last one. There are many issues, but before we get too depressed, actually a very good book I'm currently reading is called Factfulness. It's by the head, the late Dr. Hans Rosling, a Swede, who basically points out the world is actually not as bad as we all make it out to be. So, so don't get me wrong, eh? that, that, but, but there are clearly issues, and I would say today, smack center is the issue of inequality. Again, I don't need to go into detail, we all know this. Every year we read, and Davos has just done, Oxfam releases their, their famous report. I think the numbers has improved slightly, but it's still about 50 richest people own as much as 50% of the world's poorest, or thereabouts, right? Um, and if we start looking, for example, when, when crisis happens in the United States, for example, we saw the TARP program and how I think it's fair to say a lot of the TARP money didn't actually reach uh, industries in the Rust Belt or Detroit and so on and so forth. I think a lot of it went to the likes of AIG and so on and so forth. Maybe they deserve, maybe they didn't, but again, I think that looks some of the stickiness, some perhaps some of the rent seeking that Anthony kind of referred to earlier. Uh, that's a way out of this. Eh? Uh, if you look at housing uh, in many Asian cities, uh, perhaps in London as well, where, where we keep a, a small home, uh, there are very expensive but also very empty condominiums. My office in Kuala Lumpur used to be at the Twin Towers at about Maghreb time. If I look outside the window, 8 p.m., you know, there's many very nice condominiums, but probably about only 20% you see lighted. Eh? That's a rough indication of how much Disney, but yet KL is relatively okay, but if you go to Bangkok or Jakarta, side by side, some very expensive apartments, also sitting with some of the worst slums. The next point is that it's been 10 years post Lehman and 20 post the Asian crisis. Uh, the last six months or so, we saw a lot of write-ups and reviews about what has happened. But I think it's fair to say that, is it half full or is it half empty? I think to be fair, banks are certainly better capitalized. ROEs are down, but banks are better capitalized. I think the system is safer. I think we should credit the central bankers who work after the crisis when we were all staring into the abyss, so to speak. But at the same time, I think it's also fair to say some really significant structural changes. I think the debate is still out. Eh? And perhaps the masses out there, whether they wear yellow vests or whatever else, are still wondering how come, where is the accountability uh, that we're talking about? I think the truth probably lies somewhere in between, but 10 years out, uh, this is essentially the fourth point about the state of finance. I think you could probably say it's about half full, half empty. I wanted to end that, this segment of my submission or presentation that on a positive note, which is financial innovation, as we have heard, 
is alive and kicking, and NetNet, -Net, I think it holds much promise. Before I, before I do that, actually, a famous quote by a former uh, Fed, Federal Reserve Chairman, Paul Volcker, I think famously said that the only useful financial innovation in the last 20 years, and he said this, when, I believe it was in 2009, was the ATM, the automatic teller machine. I do not quite agree. It is, well, it's a very colorful quote, and the fact that it catches attention probably implies there's some, a little bit of truth in it. I think it was the, the context was 2009, and this was after all the CMOs and CDOs that kind of blew up the financial system. Actually, two forms of innovation. One, we have heard about the technology-driven innovation. But two, really, innovation in terms of investment style, in terms of uh, the types of finance, whether, for example, uh, from the equity side, this includes ESG, uh, uh, environmental sustainability and governance based kind of investing or sometimes known as sustainable investing. Uh, often this is seen as a do no harm type of investing. And on top of that, the do good type of investing, impact investing for example, social impact bonds or sukuks on the debt side, uh, so certainly social entrepreneurship and the application of good fintech. I'm, I'm trying to make a distinction in that sense between good and not so good. Uh, Anthony, I didn't have a chance to chat. Uh, one of the companies that fascinate me in the UK is this company called Wonga.com, which uh, famously in 2014, they did a great gesture that they reduced interest rates, payday lending. Uh, it went down to only 1,509% now per annum. It was about 5,000% per annum before that. Sure, we believe in liberal free markets, but at the same time, surely you know, there must be a reason to need it. It uses very clever data analytics uh, to figure out when uh, the customer would actually borrow at this kind of completely extortionate rates, right? But perhaps I hope that's just an exception that proves the rule that financial innovation also does P2P lending. One of the companies we invested in America during my time was very proud of it. It's called SOFI. What they do is for student loans. Uh, you know, very clever company. Uh, we invested uh, thankfully, very profitably into both Alibaba and Alipay, and, and it's not just the money, actually, when you see how it completely unlocks the small SME, it's not even SME, it's actually more like a micro-enterprise in places in China, and uh, the ability on Alipay, for example, ladies and gentlemen, you know, they call it 310, I think this is typically Chinese, right? I think they, they summarize this very well. It means in three minutes, you will get a decision about whether you can borrow uh, from Alipay, from N Financial, right? In one second, you get your money and a zero human interface. And this is being done at scale. Uh, I don't have the latest numbers, but we're talking about tens of millions of customers. All my Chinese colleagues, they don't, they don't carry a credit card, they carry no cash, it's just their phone. And you see these wonderful pictures of uh, uh, people in uh, what we call Pasar Malam back in Kuala Lumpur, but these are the night markets that where they, they just use QR codes to basically transact, right? So it's very common. So ladies and gentlemen, against that quick backdrop, I'm mindful of time, I'll try to catch up. Yeah, sorry. Okay, imagine, very, just to frame the discussion, we've got three, three pathways, right? That is the backdrop. My contention is that we need to return finance to its fitrah role, which is to serve the real economy and to serve society at large, right? Uh, that is not to say finance in the last 75 years, so that you don't mistake my message. I'm a great believer in that. I was part of it. It has delivered a lot of progress, just that it has lost its way perhaps the last 15, 20 years, and the symptoms are all there in the state of finance. So the three, the three forks, let's call it the great scenario, the ugly scenario, and perhaps the good scenario. Utopia, dystopia, and one more scenario, which I just coined this term, let's call it a real-topia, which is go back to the real economy. Now, in my view, I think there are enough sensible people, sensible companies, by and large, in spite of all this, uh, I think there's enough sensible institution and society itself, I think we're pushing back that the the worst excesses of the dystopian scenario, I don't think will happen. I hope not, at least, right? 
and we are all here together gathered, for example, I think thinking in those terms. The utopian scenario, for example, of fixing all this is something I've not quite figured out. If I can explain to you briefly, I call this the aquarium. So the metaphor I would like to try and use is the aquarium. What is the aquarium? The aquari let's call the aquarium being the financial system. So you can, you can understand there's a lot of liquidity, right? Uh, but there's also all kinds of fish inside, big fish, small fish, medium-sized fish, vegetation, and so on and so forth. The problem I, I, I cannot figure out is over that, from 1971 onwards, remember, that big growth in uh, financial flows and supply of money, whether it's M1, M2, M3, and, and beyond, let's take it at three levels. The first level among the central bankers is what is called fiat money. And as mentioned, once dollar was floated, being the world's reserve currency. If you track, again, I mean, they have some nice terms for it, whether it's quantitative easing, or when they slow down, they call it qualitative easing. It's already very large. On top of that, the banking system will move around through fractional reserve banking, creates another layer. And on top of that, you have, especially in the last 20, 25 years, and Anthony will know this, some of the firms I work for, UBS or Solomon, the whole derivative system, and on top of that, you have what, what is sometimes called the shadow banking system. And now you've got also a digital uh, system on top, right? The genie is already out of the bottle. And I think this system problem is something, I, at least I have not figured out, how do we put it back in? It's already out there. Sure, we can delever. Sure, we can control a little bit some of the excesses. Sure, we can make the banks better capitalized and more prudential, etc. But the genie is already out. So I haven't quite figured out. So therefore, Dystopia, no. Utopia, no. Great, no. Ugly, no. I think, overall, I wanted to end with a positive message. That the, the scenario of what I call realtopia of, is actually a very pragmatic one. And I wanted to end, perhaps for the next uh, segment, to talk about what could be done uh, as a call for action. And perhaps there are seven ideas I wanted to put forward and clustered within these ideas are stuff that we could do together or some of us in different professions, right? If I could start with the philosophy of finance, I've covered that a bit, but recognize that um, as some have observed, I think the, the thinkers, the academics, the professors, uh, Karl Marx was actually a great analyst of capitalism. I think he basically predicted the limits of capitalism. The problem with Marx is of course his solution was not very good or certainly has been discredited somewhat. So the issue now is that if we consider property to be trust rather than absolutely own or theft, uh, I think we need to basically insert the purpose back into this. And in this regard, ladies and gentlemen, you may have followed, this is now the second year that the world's largest fund manager, Larry Fink at BlackRock, I believe they manage six trillion US dollars. Larry writes to the companies that, that he invests in, in what is called a shareholder's letter, right? And usually they do this, Warren Buffett does this. They talk about, okay, what's your prospects for this coming year? We think you should be doing more, you know, to get more margin in this particular industry or this particular geography, etc. They do that too, but now he asks, what is your purpose of your business in addition to all the business metrics. I think potentially this is quite revolutionary if we follow through with it. I happen to be one of the founding members of this organization called Focusing Capital for the Long Term. Larry chairs that. Uh, together with Mark Weissman, Mark was at Canadian Pension at that time, Dominic Button, Dom was, was uh, until recently the CEO or the chairman rather of uh, McKinsey and others, right? So it's a grouping of, and I think this mindset change it's not a small matter. Obviously, the, the devil will be in the execution detail. I wanted to share briefly at Kazana, we have a measurement framework that we put in to try to look at not just the financial value, but the economic and strategic value and the societal value of our investments. One of my favorite was a company we found in the Philippines called 8990. They do affordable housing. They're also actually a financial institution because 93% of the people who buy their homes are, are not, uh, do not have bank accounts, actually. So they're financially excluded, the fact that they're able to buy houses. And for, for 
this investment actually, uh, we loved it because it had a 40% ROE. It was growing 40% per annum. Uh, the stock market price does fluctuate, but it's generally still up. Uh, the problem I had was that I couldn't somehow replicate that because there's a lot of cultural factors of this company, from, even from Philippines to my home country, Malaysia. We just couldn't get it going. I need maybe to talk to Scott on this. Okay, uh, I think there's many more examples, but at the philosophical level, if we consider that the obsession with growth economics needs to be balanced with growth and equity, for example. Uh, again, like for interest of time, I'm not going to uh, uh, drill down into the Malaysian experience, my, my own country. Uh, I note that the kingdom, as 50% of the Gulf economy, as a G20 country, as a keeper of the Holy Mosque, uh, I think Vision 2030, 2030 is a very exciting vision. Malaysia, of course, had our Vision 2020. Execution is going to be key, and human capital, and, but clearly di diversifying away from oil, and not just oil and creation of jobs, uh, is a very important part, and I believe Masik uh, is very much focused on that, eh? and you know, perhaps can have more conversations on that. But not just that, in my time off after Kazana, me and my wife had the pleasure of visiting Bhutan, for example, very famously known for gross national happiness. So I wasn't going to work, but somebody introduced, I couldn't resist it. Uh, this gentleman's name, I kid you not, is Mr. Karma. So Mr. Karma is a guy in, ch in charge of gross national happiness. And they're pretty serious, right? but you may have picked up uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister, for example, uh, she is talking about well-being now being, being something that the, the nation wants to look at. So it's not some fuddy-duddy esoteric stuff anymore. I believe over the last 10 years and what happened after the Lehman crisis and all its effect, uh, this is now center stage and mainstream. Right? When I first started at Kazana, I started talking about stakeholder value. Sometimes I got funny looks from shareholders, and rightly so. I mean, that's understandable. But today, but always is a question of balance and, and being, being proportionate. Right? So for investors, uh, again, there are many things that we could do. We talk about uh, the ESG, impact investing, perhaps during Q&A we can cover this. Job creation, I think re retraining and reskilling is, is a big opportunity with all the technology disruption. I wanted to share Kazana, one of the, thankfully we were able to grow many companies, but one very difficult company, as you know, is the case of Malaysia Airlines, right? We lost two aeroplanes in 2014, and this was a, a very harrowing experience. We had to restructure, but I must say I was very proud that we created a company that all the people that we had to lay off, now about 90% of them have been successfully retrained and reskilled. Some became Uber drivers or Grab drivers, but also certainly many of them actually started new, new careers, and that was a conscious decision. And we treated this initially as part of the cause of restructuring, but today I think there is actually an opportunity for retraining and reskilling, not just in Malaysia, but uh, perhaps this theme is clearly happening in India. We're seeing this all over in, in terms of job creation. Uh, I think third point, very important, the relationship between equity and debt. I don't have the time today, but for those of us who learn our finance, and most of us here, there's something called the capital asset pricing model, as you know, CAPM. All investment banks, anybody who runs spreadsheets will know this. But note that CAPM, actually, value is supposed to be created because of the tax shield by not paying taxes because of the write-off on the debt uh, interest, right? This is quite significant. I think it actually makes the playing field not level in terms of debt versus equity. Uh, some people are seriously looking at to make sure, and it's not just in Islamic finance circles, but in a lot of discussion on stable finance, that's looking at making sure that the equity distribution uh, is also tax deductible eh? and any forms of distribution. And for that matter, actually, it assumes paying taxes is not a good thing. While that may be true in many countries that it goes into a black hole, it may not necessarily be true, right? Uh, there's ideas around an FDA kind of approval for derivatives and structured finance. Tobin tax, of course, has been on the table for a long time. Uh, state actions, I think we were able to create something called a sovereign development fund and not just a sovereign uh, wealth fund. Uh, the promotion and restoration of trust, I think we've covered this somewhat, but certainly and long-term investing focus and good financial innovation. And finally, uh, 
ideas around having a total system that also includes charity. Um, I think the famous verses in Suratul Baqarah towards the end, roughly from about 275 to about 282, where Allah Ta'ala decreed that he will destroy riba and will give increase for sadaqat. I think it's very well known. I'm in the kingdom, you know this better than me. Uh, and certainly, I think this is not to be discounted because certainly we are seeing models with tranching technology, for example, in investing that is combining these various aspects. And we've experimented with this on social impact sukuks, for example. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close uh, with a couple of further reflections. First, I am reminded of an insight shared by an American Islamic finance scholar. Uh, I do not know him that well, but he was kind enough to call on me in my office, must have been seven, eight years ago. Uh, his name is Sheikh Yusuf De Lorenzo. I believe some in this room, Brother Iqbal and others would, would know Sheikh, Sheikh Yusuf. And what struck me actually when he came in there, and he said that all the prophets of the great Abrahamic faith were gifted with miracles that were particularly consonant with their times. So you consider Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Allah Ta'ala granted him the, uh, the ability to do magic, right? In those famous verses. At a time when the Pharaoh of Egypt had many, many magicians around him. So if you happen to be the biggest magician, you're the big guy, right? So this was uh, you know, the uh, Holy Prophet Moses. Of course, at the time of Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, with healing, and our own uh, illiterate Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Of course, the prose and poetry that he was gifted with as a miracle of the Quran, of the Holy Quran. This was signs of prophethood. So Sheikh Yusuf actually, perhaps he was trying to challenge me in this day and age of no more prophets. He says, actually, we live in financial times, and actually, the, and if you look what I've submitted over the last twenty odd minutes that finance is so uh, embedded into society today, I'm of the camp that it actually has created a lot of value, but we have to be careful eh, with all these signs that we really need to go back to the core and the fitra of finance of serving the real economy and, and good society. Back in 2008-2009 in Davos, it was the year after Lehman, uh, I recall uh, faith leaders were brought in. Eh? So from the Christian faith, for example, uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury at that time, Rowan Williams, spoke with, with beautiful, he's, he's now at Magdalene in Cambridge, as a master at Magdalene, about the need to go back to the core and the ethical values of finance, actually. After all, uh, Adam Smith himself talked about the, the, the moral sentiments as a moral philosopher, right? So. But it also means that there are no more prophets and we have to do this collectively. It cannot be done individually. So in that regard, I call for this call for action that we need to ijma and ijtihad among all of us actually from various parts of the world and various professions and various faiths actually to solve this together. Indeed, the injunctions in the Holy Quran, I'm not a scholar per se, but as we know, not many are as strongly worded as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared war on riba. In the famous verse in Surah Al-Baqarah in 278 and 279, Allah ta'ala decreed, O you who believe, be afraid of Allah and give up what remains due to you from riba. And riba, in my understanding, is not just usri, it's any form of zalim or any form of economic injustice if you are really believers. And if you do not do it, then take notice a war from Allah and his messenger but if you repent, you shall have your capital sums. Deal not unjustly, and you shall not be dealt with unjustly. So ladies and gentlemen, it's ultimately, I believe, about justice. I believe financial innovation on both the technology and the investment style is certainly part of the solution. I didn't have time to talk about it. I particularly believe some of the models coming out of China and Shenzhen in particular. Then we talk a little bit about Alipay and WeChat Pay, but also there's a company called Ping An. Shenzhen based, amazing. And they're rolling out at scale and at speed. Um, and you know, it's like they break the mold. I think I struggle somewhat with the old incumbent companies and how to make them better. 
uh, I can completely you know, relate to that So ladies and gentlemen I wanted to end That the case for action In a real topia I think is really A practical and pragmatic approach I have not figured out How are we going to uh, Basically address the utopian ideal Actually I've chosen uh, I'm, I'm en route uh, To go back to my old university Cambridge uh, to take out a visiting fellowship for the next 12 months to try and think this through actually so I decided I'm just going to be away not full time but some of the time trying to think through about finance and society and this part is certainly something I hope to do more research on but I'm also struck by the issue of justice and economic justice I wanted to close with this beautiful summary of eight wisdoms contained in Ibn Khaldun's Circle, what he calls, or what commentators have called the circle of equity in his magnum opus Al Muqaddimah, as you know. Ibn Khaldun wrote this some 641 years ago in, 300, sorry, in 1377. Uh, he's, uh, of course, written in Arabic, it's from Tunisia, from Tunis. And interestingly, throughout history, both Islamic and Western observers, from Arnold Toynbee to Edward Gibbon to even Mark Zuckerberg, actually. So, Mark Zuckerberg highlighted. Mukadimah is one of the important books that has to be read. I spoke to a, to, a, to a very dear friend, economics professor, Professor Jomo in Malaysia. He feels that this book, in the, perhaps in the next few years, given where we are in the troubled times, we probably, hopefully, will get more reading, just like Sun Tzu's Art of War, you know, got reading and, you know, from, from relatively obscure Chinese texts at that time. And my summary here is actually taken from the work of Islamic economics and finance scholar Uma Chapra who actually worked extensively here in the kingdom I've not met him but I've been following his work which is as follows and it's about how do we organize society and within it is issues around wealth around development and around finance right so the eight wisdoms are one the strength of the sovereign al-mulk lies in the implementation of the rule of law or the sharia right so this is very obvious in some ways and the rule of law, Sharia, cannot be implemented except by the sovereign. They're all interrelated, right? The sovereign cannot gain strength except through the people, al-rijal. And the people cannot be sustained except through wealth, which is al-mal. Wealth in itself cannot be acquired except through development, or al-imara. And development cannot be attained except through justice, al-adil. And justice is the criterion or al-mizan by which God will evaluate mankind and the sovereign is therefore charged with the responsibility of actualizing justice. I've been thinking this through for the last, as I, as I ran Kazana and trying to create a sovereign development fund, I understood my role, small or medium as it was, to try to actualize justice, in particular investment justice, capital allocation justice, and, uh, and ultimately economic justice. This is beautiful, I think it's timeless, as I said, circularity, and it's also universal. And if we, when we look at circular issues, we need to find, some of us who did spreadsheets, you know, where do you break that circularity? I understand it to be two. One is people, actually this is the big variable, given we are given choice. But second, is about, as we organize among each other, it's actually about justice. So ladies and gentlemen, I submit, that the great disruption ahead of us in finance is actually not a disruption at all, but in a way it's a disruption if we believe that we were disrupted along the path and the march of progress that finance has contributed so much, we need to go back to its fitra, to its natural primordial, and thank you Ame for reminding me of this term, uh, role of finance, which is actually to serve the real economy and to serve society on the basis of justice. Thank you very much.